Got a bit of a technical problem here. Come get me. Do it quickly. Jim Oltersdorf has a job not many people could do. Up a little higher. Primitive. He's a high-risk photographer, putting his life on the line every day to get the shots no one else would dare to take. This is a full-grown Alaskan brown bear with cubs. It's a sow. She could kill me with one bite in a second or horribly, horribly mangle me. It's what nightmares are made of. Fighting his way through one of the most violent environments on Earth, Jim pushes his limits to the edge to do the best possible job. This water is so frigid, if you were to fall in, it's just a matter of a couple of minutes, and, and you're dead. Every job is exceedingly dangerous. Gary, this is Jim Oltersdorf. Hey, Jim, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fine, buddy. Um, hey, listen, I got your email, and I appreciate you uh, getting back with me on all of this. Um, High-risk photographer Jim Oltersdorf just landed a contract from a large American corporation. How um, would you like to coordinate this, then? What, what works for you best? I don't know. How much time have you got? They want photographs of Alaskan brown bears, one of the world's most fearsome and dangerous predators. Okay. Bye-bye. There are over 35,000 brown bears in Alaska. And all of them are dangerous. In the past 20 years, there have been over 250 bear attacks in the state. Over 50 people have been killed. Brown bears are twice as big as the more common black bears and 20 times more dangerous. In Alaska, the brown bear is the ultimate predator. To make things worse, these killers live in one of the most violent atmospheres on Earth. For Jim, just getting to where the bears are will be treacherous. And once he's there, Jim will be face to face with one of nature's most fierce killing machines. Glenn Allsworth Jr., an expert bush pilot and guide, will fly Jim out to Funnel Creek, where several Alaskan brown bears have recently been spotted. The bears are usually pretty antisocial. They're usually not all hanging around each other like, like they are in this place. So it's the one time of year when you get all these big bears all in one place. But it's also the one time of year where the bears, a lot of them are kind of edgy because you have all these sows and cubs where, where the boars will come in and kill the cubs. These are wild animals, and they have to be treated as such because, in a sense, they, um, if you misread it, you're asking for some problems. Even if you take all the precautions, you don't have, you don't have control over all the, all the different factors that can come in. The damage they can do in a matter of just a, a couple of seconds it, it can lead to fatalities, no doubt about it. And there's many people that are lying in their graves today that took them as a joke. Getting up close and personal with wild bears will be very dangerous for Jim. But first, he has to get there. Float planes are the only choice he has. Cessna beavers are very safe when flown in normal conditions. But out here in Alaska, normal takes on a whole new meaning. There are no weather stations anywhere near Funnel Creek, Jim's destination. The planes are flying 160 miles into the wilderness, through mountain passes and over glacial waters. Yet in Alaska's uncertain environment, the weather can change on a dime. Uh, 
Almost constant cloud cover means they have to fly close to the ground to maintain visibility. Okay, we're good. If anything goes wrong, the pilot won't have more than a few seconds to react before the plane crashes to the ground. Okay, we're coming in for a landing here on this lake where all these bears are. It's a real tricky landing. Time to time, we got to get these winds right. As you see, there's a huge amount of bear population out here. I probably counted at least 50 bears just then. Wow, that was pretty exciting. Thanks. Jim is met by professional guide Jeff Duck. He will be everyone's bodyguard for the next day. Couldn't get it any better. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Perfect. I like it. Let's go find some bears. For this assignment, Jim chose to go to Funnel Creek, out in the middle of Katmai National Park. At this time of year, Funnel Creek is oversaturated with sockeye salmon coming back from the Pacific Ocean to spawn in their natural stream. It is one of nature's most spectacular phenomenons watching salmon swim upstream as tons of gallons of rushing glacial water push against them. A lot of salmon also means a lot of bears. Professional guide Jeff Duck has been scouting the area for a few days. What he saw makes everyone nervous. The Alaskan brown bears are everywhere. They are big and they are hungry. What we're gonna do is just stay in a group and uh, keep our eyes open, keep looking around 360 degrees. Also along for the ride is Jim's assistant and fiance, Lisa Perzacino. She trusts Jim with her life, but she knows this is dangerous. What scares me the most is things that could happen that are beyond our control or his control. It's a very potentially fatal environment. It's, it's very harsh, it's very hostile. You know, you can walk in right on these bears, and that's the one thing that you have to be really careful, because he might be laying down up there. He's sleeping. And about the last thing you want to do is, is take that bear and wake him up and surprise him. Bears are not social animals, and too many of their own makes these creatures edgy. Nobody wants to deal with bad-tempered Alaskan brown bears. Here we have a sow and a Oh, boy, look at here. here. She's only got one cub, and you can tell that's a smaller bear. That's a 500-pound oh, bear or so. A mature boar will go between 750 to 1,200 pounds. And they'll outrun the fastest Olympian. They have a, a speed capable of a 30-mile-hour burst. Uh, can out, from that distance there, they could outrun the horse. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Something of that size can come at you with the speed of lightning. And before you even recognize what's going on, you're in his jaws. He will tear you apart, and you will be gone. It's what, it's what nightmares are made out of. But that certainly won't stop Jim Oltersdorf he will go right to the limit to get the best possible pictures. Absolutely incredible. This is as close as we're gonna get, Jim. She looks like a nice, cuddly bear, but you've gotta give her all the respect in the world. That's the most dangerous animal right there, sow with her cub. Like most animals, this female brown bear will protect her cubs at all costs. It's hard to say what could set her off. Uh, but the better thing is to never set her off. If that sow decided that Jim and the crew were a menace to her cub, she would charge the group at full speed. That is a big sow up there. Reflexes would send everyone running for their lives, and that could be a fatal mistake. Never run from a bear. Many of them will make a mock attack. They'll make a, a charge at you. Oh, it'll take nerves of steel to stand there. But if you move back, that will incite his aggression and cause him to absolutely attack you. 
There's no predator on Earth that's any, any larger that will take those guys on if they had any brains. So it might be a little prudent to work our way over this way because she's going to be coming here. That female Alaskan brown bear and her cub are not alone. To Jim's delight, the brown bears are everywhere. Although their name doesn't strike fear in one's heart as much as grizzlies or Kodiak bears, they are the same animal. The difference is purely geographical. Alaskan brown bears live within 200 miles of the coastline, while grizzlies live inland. Since the Alaskan brown bear get to eat a great deal of salmon, they are actually bigger than most grizzlies. As for Kodiak bears, they are simply Alaskan brown bears that live on Kodiak Island. That's the big boy down there. Oh, look at this one. Jim just hit the jackpot. Right off those bluffs, several bears are feasting on salmon. He must approach them as stealthily as possible. He doesn't want to surprise them out of their lunch or incite one of them to become aggressive. Among the feeding bears is a sow trying to feed her cubs. She could become very agitated if Jim invades her space. She looks really unsure if she wants to leave those cubs alone down there. He'll try to get as close as possible to the bears. He must find just the right spot that will enable him to get the photographs he needs without provoking the wild animals. These bears are absolutely unbelievable. This footage I'm getting here is extraordinary. It's, it's, these aren't park bears, these are wild bears. To get those incredible pictures, Jim must take risks. But that's what high-risk photography is all about. To go to the edge and to peer over is an extraordinary experience that absolutely makes me as alive and vibrant as I ever could be. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. So I'm standing here, or sitting here. I, uh, I'm on a cliff, and it's, uh, it's certainly without question breakneck if uh, this should give way. Uh, in order to get these shots, I have to, again, put myself in the best opportunity. Come on, big boy, get that fish, will you? And uh, it's all loose here, so you got to be extremely careful. You have to be aware of what we call situational awareness of not only the bears that could harm us, but the, uh, the actual physical part of it. That's a young sow, and she's, she's learning herself how to uh, uh, fish. And as, as, he, as she progresses in age, she'll become more proficient, where just about any time she dies in, she's going to get a, uh, a, a salmon. Well, I got a sow that uh, is trying to assess where she's fishing to see if it's worthwhile for her effort or she'll move. And so patience is a virtue in this. I like to get the teeth into the fish. I like that drama of, of the successful uh, meal gathering, you might say. So what we want to do is catch it just like what she's doing right now. She's coming in, nice splash, miss the fish. I love color. I've shot color all of my life. It's a, it's a vibrancy of our earth. And I like to, in my imagery, draw the scent of the surroundings. I want that vicarious experience visually to be brought to those people. Kind of an irony of things. I want them to be lured by what I do to bring them in. Maybe to say, oh, I wouldn't want to do that, but I sure felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when I saw Ultersdorf standing on the edge of that cliff with maybe that much of his foot hanging off of it. Jim often has to push himself to the limit of his physical and mental abilities. If anything goes wrong, experience is his best ally. It's not luck that pulls you through. It's, it's you thinking your way through in microseconds because those decisions will yield whether you live or die. If, of course, you miscalculate, um, you're not going to come home. Now this bear that I'm shooting, the nice thing about his behavior is he's in this brush, and you could walk five yards from him and you'd never see him. 
You never want to go into those areas like that. You'll just see a tuft of fur, and then you're a dead man. That bear will attack you as stealthy as a cat stalks a mouse. You'll never hear him. You'll never see him until the last second when he comes charging out of that woods at you. When he makes that attack on you, especially with an Alaskan brown bear, one of the things you have to understand is why is he making that attack? And if he's viewing you as a food source, you have to fight him. Jim has got both feet planted in loose rocks inches from the edge of a ravine. If he falls down, he may very well kill himself instantly. That is, if he's lucky. Because if he does fall, he'll fall right at the foot of a sow and her two cubs. Jim would be ripped to pieces by the protective mother. Even the cubs would take a bite. I can see the claws on this animal. And these claws, without question, as I fire on them, and I'm only shooting the foot right now, are absolutely devastating to anything that comes within its grasp. I wouldn't go any closer because uh, then I'm, I'm pushing a limit on this bear. And that's the difference between being a professional and being an amateur. And, and my knowledge says that you don't want to get any closer because she will attack. She'd come on to me without a problem with those cubs. There's not too many people in the world that get that close to those cubs and a sow in a, in a wild environment like this. You should cl clamber up right here in a matter of just a couple seconds. Uh, no more than two seconds she'd be on me. The likelihood of me being able to produce my weapon that I'm carrying on my side here and drawing fire on her would be pretty well removed because it just happens too quickly. And she'd maul me, she'd bite me, and, and I would suppress my behavior where I, I'd just stop any kind of movement. And in other words, I'm going to convince her, if I did get attacked, that she's neutralized me. So that threat now is eliminated and she'd simply walk away from me. There we go. Okay, there we go. This is the most dangerous situation that one can place themselves in on planet Earth as far as a, a, a giant Alaskan brown bear in the wilds with her cubs. And, and in essence, I'm kind of in between them. I don't particularly like that, but it's better that I just stay here and not move. Going to those extremes is risky enough, but Jim also has to concentrate on taking great photos. Well, that's the double whammy. I think that's what separates the boys from the men. I have to have that situational awareness of, of my surroundings because these animals may come in and attack me. I might fall off the cliff because I've been so sighted in with my camera. I'm looking down this tube. I don't have peripheral vision. It's very narrow. So I have to rely on my hearing, even sometimes my smell. It's like two different books that you're trying to read at the same time. And sometimes it, it, it becomes very complex. I feel both my eyes are like a chameleon going in different directions. I have to be the best out there. I, when I'm doing the, the front covers of these magazines or books or taking and creating imagery that is going to uh, symbolize a multi-million dollar company, there's no doubt that pressure is there. And you have to realize that there's a definitive line that you must not cross and it's, it sometimes is almost invisible. Even if Jim won't consciously cross that invisible line, he might try to stretch it. We got one coming right at The pictures from the top of the bluff were very good, but Jim wants some eye-level action photos of these bears. These are just young boys. Yeah, but we got no way out, though. Every bear has cubs here. I know it. That's a big one down there. You mean the one on the left? Yeah. And we are surrounded by him. That's good. That's a good thing, Jeff. That's yep. what we came here for. Yep. I'm glad you got some bears today. He managed to convince professional guide Jeff Duck to accompany him down into the water. They basically will be walking right into the bear's buffet table. It'll yeah, I cool. want to get out of here as quick as I can. <laughs> Oh, Jeff, these are beautiful pictures. You know, you wait a lifetime for these kind of th opportunities. Even though he's an experienced outdoorsman and hunter, Jeff is still nervous. Oh, hey, hang on a minute. Let's see what the sow's doing. In his mind, they crossed that invisible line between safe and sorry. 
Let's uh, start backing up a little bit, Jim. She's working her way through that brush. Okay, we're holding them up now. We'll have to get going. They want to get yeah. up here again, I think. Why don't we go give them a little room? Do this quick, Jim. Well, we're blocked from the other group, though. Bears normally don't attack groups of people because they find them more intimidating. But two lone men trekking through a salmon-filled stream might be a different story. Yeah, that's, that one, the little one I don't mind, it's the big sow yeah. there. That one right there, that's a beautiful bear. I want to get a shot of him, hang on. And right now, they've got six Alaskan brown bears coming right at them. Those other three are gonna push him up here. Yep. I'm scared all the time when I'm up there. If I didn't, I that's the day I probably or should quit. They look much bigger down there, don't they? <laughs> they do. Woo! <laughs> they do. Man. After and at the end of the day, I swear, Jeff, these packs weigh about 750 pounds each. I think some of the dangerous things that I do, if we want to call them dangerous things, I call it a job description of, it's just like taking out the garbage or delivering newspapers or going down to the office. My office is a lot different, but to me, it's, it's, it's my life. It's, it's the style of which I, I approach it. So every job is exceedingly dangerous. And I, I recognize that. Therefore, I'm, I try to make it undangerous, if such a word exists, that I try to eliminate all of those things that occur that cause a fatality. But even then, obviously there's things out of control that, that are going to happen. The earth here is very, very unstable. And that's where the crux of it is, that you have to be prepared. You, I, I cannot become overcome by the emotion that I'm going to lose my leg or that I'm gonna have a rope go around my neck and I get strangled or, or that if I fall, that the fear of the falling keeps me from thinking rationally because it is absolutely panic that will kill you or cause an injury every single time. Once again, Jim is pushing himself to his limits, riding that invisible line that separates safe from sorry. If he loses his footing, he'll fall just a few feet from hungry bears that might just prefer fresh meat over salmon. This is too close for comfort, and Jim knows it. The beauty of these animals in their impressive setting can be mesmerizing. It is almost calling out to Jim to come just a little bit closer. That lure, that illusion of safety, can be a killer. The lure is a fascinating emotion. It, it tries to bring you in. You don't feel that in any other condition in, in your life. So it just starts to, almost like a fish hook on a line, draw you in farther and farther until maybe you're past a couple of these windows that you didn't perceive. And then when, when you realize that you're past them, the door closes. Jim and his crew just started walking along the edge of the ravine when a large bear appeared out of nowhere. It was sleeping in the tall grass when Jeff Duck stumbled upon it. It's a big game of chess trying to dodge all these bears. Yeah. I'm just going around, Mr. Bear. Jeff backed up, letting the bear know that it is superior. Jeff's 12-gauge shotgun is loaded with a rubber bullet in the chamber and deer slugs in the magazine. The rubber bullet would not kill the bear. It would only sting it and hopefully send it running away. You always keep your eyes open this tall grass. They just appear out of nowhere in here. It's amazing a 700-pound animal like that can hide in nowhere. And of course, high-risk photographer Jim Oltersdorf wants a photo of that bear. Okay, we'll stop. The pictures I've taken in my life are countless, but when you get that one, 
You've earned it. You sweated, you, you bled for it. You've trained for it. Not only creatively, but you've trained in your heart for it and, and in your mind to get you into that environment. Um, that's where the greatest fruits are. There's two sleeping right down there. The wild beauty of the Alaskan landscape makes a jaw-dropping backdrop for Jim's photography. A single click from Jim's camera over 100 yards away is enough to wake the sleeping bears. You've got to be careful here because you can get fixated on these animals because they're so close in proximity. And without you knowing it, another bear can come up behind and, and sneak right up. If he's a rogue bear, he's going to take you out. He'll attack you. He, he'll, uh, he'll look at you as a food source. These guys here, if they're pressed and, and they're pressured, even though they're young bears, they still have a very capable defense. They will attack you if uh, you press it. Just photographically, it's, it's just really, really cool. They will walk on this kind of ground, and they're absolutely soundless. You will not hear any noise emitted from, from their padded feet. You may hear the click of their claws, which can probably be about this long on some of the more mature bears. And they'll stand upwards of in the excess of 10 feet tall. For Jim Oltersdorf, the bear shoot is a complete success. He got several hundred beautiful pictures that his clients will love. And more importantly, no one got hurt. What an incredible day. Time to go back home and get ready for the next assignment. It's going to be a long week for Jim. He's got several assignments that will make the bear shoot look like a walk in the park. We got a bit of a technical problem here. Come get me. Do it quickly. When it comes to aerial photography, high-risk photographer Jim Oltersdorf is a world-renowned specialist. All right. He has taken pictures for almost every aviation magazine in the country. This time, it's Pilot Magazine that wants pictures of a 1943 Stinson plane in action. To take the shots, Jim rented a small Cessna and had the pilot take out the right side door. Jim will be working half in, half out of the airplane. This is not a job for the faint of heart. Jim has tied himself to the plane's frame using heavy-duty ropes and clasps. To keep his balance, he must maintain pressure on his restraints. If anything breaks or comes undone, Jim will fall right off the plane, and he is not wearing a parachute. The bright, flashy yellow and purple suit is to give rescuers a better chance to find his body. Jim has been a pilot for over 30 years, so he knows exactly what he's getting into. He knows the dangers are not always where you expect them to be. While on assignment some years ago, he flew his airplane through high voltage power lines. They were 27,000 volts, and it was a blinding flash of light and uh, a sound that only dead men hear. When they separated, it hit my fairing on my wheels on the right side, and then they snapped into my wing. I was helpless, and we sat in that aircraft over those mountains at breakneck speed, and my aircraft was burning, literally burning. And the next few seconds of what your decisions are will yield whether you live or die. Jim never panicked and miraculously landed the damaged plane, saving his life and his passengers. That close call did not stop him. He took it in stride and learned from it. It taught him firsthand that the fear of dying can be controlled and even turned it into a very powerful asset. You know, when the chips go down, when you're looking at the other side, you become very uncomfortable. I become, I, I'm scared as hell. Your mouth becomes foul tasting. Your breathing becomes labored. You sweat. But scared means that it's part of the 
the backpack or the goods in a backpack that you carry. It's part of the performance. And if you understand that, then you, then you can deal with it. You can, you can almost invite it. You can say, come on, bring it on. Let's challenge me. That's why I'm here. And that sharpens you. That's when you become very focused at the task at hand to provide excellence. The task at hand is to take air-to-air -air pictures of this small 1943 Stinson plane. To get good shots, the Stinson and Jim's plane must fly in close formation, something that is not recommended in the best of conditions. But out here in the Alaskan mountains, the ferocious winds are giving Jim and the pilots a hard time. Getting good pictures is what it's all about, but staying alive is their number one priority. OK, good deal. If you hold it right there, we'll keep adjusting, try to keep the same distance here. I'll do it. Hey, guys, Radio traffic the between the planes is nonstop. Both pilots always need to know what the other one is doing. 25 to 30. 25 to 30. Affirmative. Hold steady. Hold steady. Any sudden gust of wind could have fatal consequences. In this extreme environment, you don't get second chances. The wind's making it a little bit tough to hold an altitude here. We'll uh, let me try to reposition back in again. Copy. They constantly have to adjust their altitude, trying to find smoother air, but also to give the high-risk photographer better angles for his imagery. The photographs that I produce invoke emotions in people. And many times, especially for an example, in shooting um, this type of imagery, when I'm hanging out of an aircraft, and maybe I'm um, shooting a vintage aircraft, when that gets published and millions of people around the world see that, I'll get phone calls and I'll get emails from people, pilots, who had, back in 1940, had flown airplanes like that. And so when they read that story about that aircraft that I had photographed, uh, it brings it right to the day that they were flying their own at that moment. To get those meaningful pictures, Jim has to work very hard. I work in the most violent of atmospheres in the entire world. I'm, I'm buffeted. I'm attacked by 200 mile an hour winds. Well, he's got good light on him too. And so you can only begin to imagine that feeling that I have very deep in my heart when I am challenged by all of these gachus, yet I walk away and the picture, after I look at it on my computer, is razor sharp and it's going to be a front cover. And front covers, Jim has done a lot of them. He started his career almost 30 years ago in LA, shooting high fashion and glamour photography. He quickly built a solid reputation that landed him some fabulous contracts. Single and good looking, Jim had it all, or so it seemed. It was exciting, it was flirting with danger in, in a sense. Beautiful women, exotic locations, Rolls Royces, limousines. But I always felt empty at the end of the day made good money doing it, but there was something that wasn't feeding my heart. I, it wasn't touching me. One day, he packed his things and left for Montana. No one could comprehend why he left such a seemingly perfect life. You answer to your heart. There's, there's no other way of saying it. And so I realized that I was at my happiest shooting trout in a stream. Jim quickly realized that he worked best in difficult, more challenging environments, shooting pictures where other people wouldn't even think of taking a camera. Today, Jim is one of the world's most respected high-risk photographers. Don't do the mundane. Go to the extraordinary. Seize the greatest opportunity. And all of the while, enjoy it, because then you become exuberant about your work. You become energetic, and that will show in uh, imagery that you create. After his air-to-air -air photo shoot, Jim rented a boat to fulfill two other photo shoots. He wants to go to a remote waterside location where he will escalate a steep mountainside and then rappel down. 
Hanging 100 feet over the frigid water, Jim will take photos of the astonishing landscape. But first, he'll use the boat to get as close as possible to the Holgate Glacier. He wants to get eye-level shots of it. Those photographs will go in Jim's photo bank and will be offered to anyone who might need them. Those waters are saturated with icebergs of all shapes and sizes. From smaller ones the size of a basketball to larger ones that can weigh several tons, they are a captain's worst nightmare. A lot of accidents. People wreck the bottom of their boats. They hit the ice too hard. Sam Bullion is focused on those floating chunks of ice, doing all he can to steer clear of them. This quick sightseeing tour could turn very ugly in the blink of an eye. The small inflatable lifeboat the ship is carrying is not large enough to hold everyone on board. We could have a small-scale Titanic-like event right here. In Alaska, cold water immersion is the second leading cause of death. But Jim won't settle for long shots of the glacier. He's always looking for different perspectives, for images that no one else will get. Pretty soon you'll be able to hear the, the ice calving. The captain of the boat has found an iceberg-free channel and is navigating closer and closer to that breathtaking ice wall. What looked from a few miles away to be no more than a slowly rising pile of snow is actually an ice wall several hundred feet high. It is one of the most spectacular landscapes anyone could see. Glaciers are very dynamic, almost alive. You can hear the ice crack and rumble as giant blocks of ice grind against each other. Millions of tons of ice and debris are pushing down towards the water, making the iceberg calve almost continuously, causing large pieces of ice to break off and fall in the water. This is exactly what Jim is hoping to catch. I'm waiting for one to be spectacular where it will just fall right off and into the water and get this. Something kind of like that. <laughs> Captain Sam Bullion has done a fine job. The boat is getting closer and closer to the glacier. The breathtaking scenery is grandiose. If a large piece of ice was to calf, something that happens on an almost daily basis, it would create a tsunami that this boat is not equipped to ride. That wave could be 30 feet in the air and just come right over and turn the boat right over. This is very dangerous to do something like this. This water is, is so frigid, survivability uh, if you were to fall in, it's just a matter of a couple of minutes, and, and you're dead. Just balancing yourself on a boat like this right on the edge, you get one wave, you hit an iceberg here, you're going to lose your camera, your, all your gear, and you could lose your life doing this. But that's the way you get these kinds of pictures. You have to go to that edge. You have to take that risk. That's what we wait for. The ice cracking sounds like small explosions, and they seem to be more and more frequent coming off the left side of the glacier. That gets all of Jim's attention. If this whole thing should happen to fall, we just hope it doesn't. I think what we need to do is we need to swing around and go back down to this uh, other shoot that I'm going to do. It's time to go. Jim still has the repelling shots to do today, but the incredible beauty of this natural theater makes it hard to leave it behind. Some of those sounds are scary though, man. Moving away from the Holgate Glacier, Jim will take a few minutes in the underdeck to mentally prepare himself. 
he knows that his next photo shoot is going to be one of the toughest he's ever done. Jim scouted this place a few weeks ago. He wants to climb on top of this mountain and rappel down right over the opening in the rocks. He believes he'll get a unique perspective by shooting photos through the hole in that rock formation. Uh, I think I want to go right, right into that cove and then work up all the way up through there. It's going to be a pretty good climb. All right, we're rocking and rolling, boys and girls. I've been accused of insanity, complete nuts, crazy, you name it. You have a death wish. That's the biggest one that comes up. I'll be hanging from that rope probably a good 20 minutes or so. The irony is we all have a life wish. People like myself, we participate. There's an old saying that I absolutely love that strikes me dear to my heart. And it is for I would rather live a day as a lion than a century as a lamb. Certainly applies. The lion in Jim Oltersdorf is about to climb what few people would even attempt. The first 50 feet or so is all granite wall. It's an almost vertical climb that offers very few solid handholds. And keep in mind that Jim is carrying his equipment on his back. His backpack carries roughly the same weight as a fully loaded golf bag. The rock quickly gives way to dense and thick underbrush and loose soil. Jim has to fight for a secure hold through every single inch of this vertical climb. What started out as a tough climb quickly degenerates into a battle for survival. I can't traverse this. I gotta go straight vertical. 25 more feet, and I'm on the first ridge, I think. The brush is so thick that Jim is virtually invisible to the boat. Nope, I'm dead end. Oh, ow. There's a nice one to break my leg on. I'm 54 years old, five grandchildren. I do notice that there's, there's times where uh, physically I'm much more challenged than what I was when I was 25. But I also realize too that I'm a lot smarter. I have a lot more experience. I gotta tie myself off here because I'm gonna fall if I don't. That's not a heavy tree to bet your life on. After almost an hour of constant struggle, Jim is near the top. He's got no room to maneuver, and the rocks are crumbling under his weight. One wrong move, and Jim could fall 200 feet into freezing water. Oh, I love freehand. In my industry, you don't have to have, have biceps of a, of a bodybuilder. You don't have to have legs of a sprinter. You don't have to have the breath hold of a world record deep sea diver. What you do have to have is what's between your ears, the ability to use your mind and to think rationally as you're met with the opposition. Jim has finally reached the top of the mountain but he's not positioned over the hole. He'll have to move sideways so he can come down on his mark. It's, it's the worst I've ever, ever climbed. Jim is exhausted, and that's when accidents happen. <laughs> that falling debris is a very realistic reminder of what could happen to him if he lets his guard down. You can get killed in, 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 a, in a millisecond. And when it will happen is when you think that you've gotten on top. Almost two hours after he started his climb, Jim manages to position his rope where he wants to rappel down. The hard part seems to be over, so this is where the fun should start. But problems often arise when you least expect them. As he starts his descent, only seconds away from pulling out his camera and reaping the rewards of all his efforts, something goes terribly wrong. OK, I'm not going to get the shot. You're going to have to come down and get me, boys. we got a bit of a technical problem here. Hanging 60 feet above the rocks and freezing water, fatigue sets in for Jim, causing both of his hands to cramp up. Come get me. He is not using climbing equipment that would allow him to let go of the rope. If he does let go, 
he'll fall straight down. Do it quickly! The water is freezing cold. It would instantly knock the breath out of him. Unable to use his cramped up arms and hands and weighted down by his photographic equipment, Jim would sink like a rock. Quickly! Hanging on to that rope with his last shreds of energy. Quickly! Jim knows that he cannot allow himself to panic. Because it will get you. It's an invisible ghoul that stalks you every second of the way. Please hurry! Help is on the way. Lisa, Jim's assistant and fiancé, is getting there as fast as she can. With only seconds to spare, she manages to get the boat right under Jim. He can slowly release the pressure on the rope and start to go down. Had a malfunction. Get right under me. It's a controlled fall, yeah. right into her waiting arms. Uh, it happened very quickly because uh, at one point, uh, you know, at one minute, oh I thought God. everything was just fine, and, and there would be 20 minutes of him just taking pictures and enjoying himself, and all of a sudden it, it turned. And yeah, that was, that was pretty scary. And then pin that one back. Oh, oh. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't un put my fingers out. I can't move them out. Oh, okay, pull them out. Oh. All right. Lisa is one of the most oh. inspirational people oh. that I've ever encountered in my life. Oh, yeah. Pull them out. Pull my fingers out. Oh, Ow. She was there for me. Oh, God. Let me put my hair down. I was just glad he could hang on long enough for me to get there. I was just really thankful. It was just a stressful time, I guess, and just an emotional. I, uh, I had a couple things go wrong on me up right as I went off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at my hands. Oh, then my fingers back up, man. Yeah. Oh. oh, my arm. Oh. Uh. After going through hell, Jim finally gets back in the boat, shaken, but safe and sound. 13 things went wrong right at the very last part. It's extre extremely frustrating. My fingers just, they just cramped right up, both of them. I, could, I couldn't even open them. I couldn't do anything with them. If you gain it all, then it's not high risk. There's always that element, no matter what, what I'm doing, it's, it's, it's elusive. You all right? Yeah. Let's go home. No loons out today. They'll be here tonight, though, you think? For Jim Oltersdorf, going home at the end of the day is right. just a transition between adventures. Great day to go out on the water, isn't it? This gentle soul will always be happier playing outside. I believe absolutely in fate. And I think that my fate, what's, what's said to my heart, my spirit, it simply said, go out and take all the pictures you can. Show the world what they really have. Look at, look at the, the purse, the extremely magnificent earth. It's, it's all there for everyone. And it's up to me, in many cases, to show those people who have not been exposed yet to that rawness, to that beauty. That's my responsibility. Thank you.